Well, the next session will be mine on pulmonary coccidioidomycosis. I want to thank Rebecca for that excellent review of the epidemiology, and it's so exciting uh, to see the state and uh, CDC remain uh, very interested in this uh, disease because uh, it, as she depicted, this is a very, very important disease for our state. Now, this is another way of looking uh, at uh, uh, at infection with, co uh, with coccidioides, and this is from my friends Theo Kirkland and Josh Fuhrer. They published this a few years ago. And I want to emphasize, because it's absolutely true, we believe fully 60% of all people who become infected with coccidioides have no symptoms. And that was shown years and years ago uh, by Smith uh, doing skin test studies. And I've actually observed that and am uh, an individual who did asymptomatically uh, convert. And as uh, Rebecca mentioned, those individuals, by and large, have no other problems, uh, and they remain immune lifelong. Uh, then we think maybe 35% have a symptomatic primary pneumonia, which is uh, maybe a very indistinguishable from a, a bacterial community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, some of those people, maybe 5%, have what is truly valley fever, because that was the original name of, uh, of this entity in the San Joaquin Valley fever where people had a mnemonic syndrome but also had a rash, either erythema multiforme or erythema nodosum. That's actually the, where the term valley fever comes from. And then, as uh, Rebecca mentioned, there's this big debate. 5% uh, have uh, chronic management issues. We think fewer than 1% actually disseminate, that is, have clinical disease outside the thoracic cavity. But then there are other patients with pulmonary diseases that have management issues. So the vast majority of cases of valley fever resolve and are not a clinical problem. Uh, but because there are so many uh, instances occurring, uh, that 5% uh, looms large as an absolute number. So we've already gone over, you know, the common presenting sim symptoms, and I'm going to give you a little different prism, uh, and I am going to mention the two studies that Rebecca mentioned, but as a clinician, I'm going to give you a feeling I have that if you really think about it, you can pick out cases uh, of valley fever clinically, even though the studies don't show that. And there's a reason for that, because studies are just collecting data, but you're actually interacting and seeing a patient. So I'm going to go over that. And we've gone over these, these symptoms, cough, pleuritic, chest pain, fever. Uh, most valley fever is actually acute, occurring over days. And as we've mentioned, it's very difficult or can be difficult. And these are the papers already mentioned. Here's the uh, Lisa Valdivia's paper, and I'm not going to go over that except to say what was interesting about this is that uh, 16 of these patients were seropositive. That is a debate about this particular paper because uh, did that serology represent the episode that brought them into the emergency room or was it uh, lingering positive serology. But one of the interesting points of this study is all the patients who had a positive serology and did get, they did get multiple courses of antimicrobial or antibacterial agents, none of them ever got treated for valley fever and all of them did fine. And that's one of the points to emphasize that most cases of uh, primary pulmonary coccidioidomycosis do just fine without any therapy. And then we also mentioned uh, the Kim paper that Dr. Blair was a co-author on, and also demonstrating that maybe a lot of these cases of primary pulmonary uh, uh, that we pre pres presume to be a community-acquired bacterial pneumonia are, in fact, valley fever. And again, it gives you that sense that many of these cases uh, don't require treatment and get better on their own and might not ever be diagnosed if you didn't look real hard. So what are the things, if you're sitting in clinic, that might suggest to you, and again, the, the, none of the studies ever find this, but I will tell you as a clinician, when we see patients in clinic or we're seeing them in consultation, these can be helpful. So patients will often tell you they have night sweats. Now, night sweats are difficult to ask about in Arizona, maybe not today, but in the summer. True night sweats are, are an exacerbation of the normal uh, 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 warming in the early hours of the morning. And so what you want to ask about, are you really just soaking your, the sheets and soaking your pajamas? And you will pick that up. And I've actually 
have myself stopped in the tracks when, when either a patient volunteered that information or I asked about it. And that is something that probably one doesn't see in a bacterial community acquired pneumonia. Fatigue I'm going to go into because we did a study, but that is worth asking about as well. Because again, patients with a bacterial community acquired pneumonia won't really tell you that they're fatigued, that they have trouble doing their activities of daily living, yet it's such a common uh, phenomenon in valley fever. The rash we'll talk about, headache. Now, headaches are a frequent, have been frequently noted with primary pulmonary coccidioidomycosis. There are nothing specific about them. They don't mean that the patient has meningitis, and one wants to be careful about that, and I think Dr. Blair may talk about that. But it is part of that syndrome. A loss of weight, again, if this is a severe case of valley fever, people uh, tend to feel fatigue, they lose their appetite. These are sort of the, some of the things that really start to suggest this might be valley fever and not just a simple bacterial process. Now, there are a series of rashes associated. Uh, and one is a rare one, and I hope my slides come through, that I've rarely seen, and that's toxic erythroderma. That usually occurs in, in uh, younger adults uh, or children, and it's just this diffuse red scaly rash uh, that is very nonspecific. But the two you want to really know about for valley fever are enodosum and emultiforme. So enodosum is... Uh, almost always these red uh, or violaceous, painful nodules on the lower extremities, usually the shins, most common in women, but we've seen it in men, usually in young people. And enodosum is felt to be a manifestation of uh, cellular immunity, uh, so it's sort of the body's own way of, of, in essence, reacting to the skin test. And so uh, the data do support that people who have enodosum usually have a benign course. That's not always true, uh, but it does seem to be the case. It's more common in women. Uh, Dr. Sonenshine uh, already told you that women uh, tend to do better with this disease and they are more likely to have enodosum. Now, emultiforme is much less common. Uh, and that's, of course, these target lesions. And in coxie, the target lesions are frequently in a necklace distribution. And I've seen this where patients come in and they'll have these targeted lesions uh, around the neck. I've seen at least one patient receive corticosteroids for that. So if you see either a necklace uh, rash or enodosum, these painful, violaceous lesions, think coccidioidomycosis, get an x-ray. Because you'll see then uh, in those cases, a, a, a pulmonary infiltrate, even if the patient isn't complaining of that. This was actually a, uh, a reserve a pilot for the National Guard, an F-16 pilot, and she just had enormous uh, pains in her legs. She also had desert rheumatism or, or arthralgias in association with a focal pulmonary infiltrate. So I mentioned desert rheumatism, and this often goes hand in glove with, with, with the rashes of enodosum and emultiforme. And these are either arthralgias, more rarely an arthritis, uh, that's associated with a pulmonary infiltrate. And some years ago, uh, I was seeing one of the nurses uh, at the VA hospital, and she had a terrible uh, our, uh, wrist our arthralgias in association with enodosum had no pulmonary symptoms, but in fact, when we got a chest x-ray, she had one and she had a positive serology. So again, these are things that should really tip you off. They probably only occur 5% of all uh, mnemonic cases, but if you see them, uh, you really want to think that if you're in the endemic area. Obviously, there are a lot of other causes of enodosum and emultiforme, but in in uh, the mid portion of Arizona, coxie is going to be the major ete etiology. So I want to mention uh, chronic fatigue. We did a study, Jennifer Bowers uh, uh, was a nutritionist I work with, and she actually did this for her PhD. And we just kept seeing all this fatigue uh, in our clinic. So we decided, well, let's see if we can't quantify it. So we actually used a multiple sclerosis scale and took patients uh, 48 symptomatic patients with coxie and applied this scale. And we found that 65% by this scale had significant fatigue uh, as measured. And what was different, we, we actually did a control group of just uh, general veterans patients. And uh, I don't know if I was shocked or not, but they were also very fatigued. But there was a difference. Uh, those 
with valley fever not only were fatigued, but were losing a body, their body mass index was going down. So they were losing weight and fatigued, while the other group, while they were fatigued and they were less so fatigued, but they were fatigued, but they were gaining weight. So loss of weight in association with fatigue should really uh, trip you off. Now, the fatigue does get better. And as we measured it over time, and as I've seen this in clinic, uh, patients will get better. And the way I usually ask about it is, is not, you know, are you better today than yesterday, but to ask week by week and even month by month. And it's, it's just amazing how patients will tell you, oh, I'm definitely better than I was two weeks ago. So the fatigue slowly gets better. We were never able to uh, identify any factors associated with the fatigue. That is, uh, you could have this with a fairly benign course or a severe course. So fatigue seems to be a, a general factor, and I do think it's worth asking about. So let's talk about the chest radiograph uh, because I think there's some uh, points, again, that should tip you off uh, for a patient. So usually uh, the pneumonia one sees or the process in the lung one sees is focal, and it may be upper or lower lobe. So we have a rule when I consult is that any upper lobe pneumonia I see certainly in the hospital is not a community-acquired pneumonia, and that's a good rule to go by because uh, community-acquired pneumonia is, by, by definition, an aspiration, and people aspirate into their lower lobe. So if you're seeing anything in upper lobe, that should give you pause. And I've just seen that ignored by non-infectious diseases clinicians, and we always come by and say, there's something unusual here. Now, a lot of things give you upper lobe pneumonia. Of course, the classic is tuberculosis, and that's because of oxygenation in, in the upper lobe. Uh, tumors obviously can be in upper lobe, and you can get an obstructive pneumonia in the upper lobe. Why coxie may occur in the upper lobe, I don't think has ed ever adequately been explored, but it certainly occurs there with some frequency. The other things to look for, often these pneumonias are extremely dense radiographically. As I mentioned, they're upper lobe, and the other trick is they often cause hyalur or mediastinal adenopathy. Now, again, when people look at radiographs, they frequently don't focus and look at the, at the adenopathy. But if one does and one sees that, that's a tip-off because, again, bacterial pneumonias do not cause adenopathy. So here's some examples. This is actually an African-American man who developed this uh, pneumonia in January can see there, and it's upper lobe, and we also see that there's some adenopathy there. Now, he wasn't diagnosed until uh, several months later, I think a, a serology was finally obtained, and he remained symptomatic, so he came back in here. Now, three months later, we can all see he's already improved, um, and he, but he still has some evidence of adenopathy. So this would be a pretty classic, and I think if one looks at all of these, you can see just how dense this initial infiltrate is, and then if you can look, you do see that adenopathy there. And if you have trouble seeing it, just always go to the radiologist and specifically ask them. This is a fairly uh, classic case of primary pulmonary coxy. Here's another one, and this is a case we saw years ago in consultation, and this patient had already been on four different antibacterial uh, agents by the time we were asked to see him. And again, you can see this very, very dense left lower lobe infiltrate in association with adenopathy. This patient also had peripheral blood eosinophilia. So there were all these hints that this, this could be coccidioidomycosis, which indeed it was. Now, there are, that's the usual kind of primary pulmonary uh, uh, coccidioidomycosis, which is focal. But occasionally you'll see diffuse, or sometimes we call it miliary pulmonary coccy. Now, just to back up on the term miliary, it's one I don't like, because it really, it really is a term we use for uh, overwhelming uh, pulmonary tuberculosis from a mycobacillemia. These occur in two, two distinct uh, flavors. The first is in highly immunocompromised patients. So prior to effective antiretroviral therapy, this was a common presentation of coccidioidomycosis in an HIV patient who was highly immunosuppressed. 
but it also may occur from high inoculum exposure. And interestingly enough, that has been uh, the most frequent cases we've seen in the last few years. And as uh, Rebecca mentioned, archaeology remains a unique uh, risk factor, uh, probably because in certain sites there's a very high inoculum exposure. So here's the uh, Here's diffuse pulmonary coxy in an AIDS patient. And again, we can just see this diffuse process uh, with kind of both very small nodules and streaking and uh, maybe due to other etiologies. Here's a case uh, from Bob Larson, though, from many years ago, from 1985. He reported two cases uh, in archaeology students. And here's day one when this one archaeology student came in with just has these large, large, almost nodular lesions. And then by day four, you can see these have become diffuse and extensive. And if you look closely, you can see the radiopaque line of an endotracheal tube. So these patients often do very poorly, need to be intubated. Uh, and they're very difficult uh, because often their serology is not positive on initial presentation. There's nothing unique. This can look like ARDS. Uh, frequently, we make the diagnosis by culture, and that takes several days. And uh, this has a, a significant mortality associated with it. So when should we suspect coccidioidal pneumonia? And I've kind of mentioned the things I think about. And again, I acknowledge that clinical studies frequently or don't uh, come out with these factors. But as a clinician, I've noticed them. And the first is on the history. Does the patient have fatigue, headache, night sweats, and weight loss? So again, if you're seeing a patient, particularly with, with a persistent process, it's worth asking about those factors. Secondly, we look at the x-ray. Is this upper lobe, is it dense, and is there hyalur or mediastinal adenopathy? If those factors are present, that should really make you think of valley fever and uh, not a bacterial process. And then finally, probably one of the most common reasons I might see a patient is because they failed antibiotics. And so I'm asked, well, what, what next antibiotic should I put this patient on, Dr. Ampel? And the real answer is, well, what really is causing this mnemonic process? And so that is, uh, so if the patient keeps failing and has been through a couple courses of antibiotics, that certainly should give you pause. And then I mentioned already once is peripheral blood eosinophilia. We're not quite sure why eosinophilia occurs in coccidioidomycosis. Sometimes you, one gets even uh, tissue eosinophils, uh, but it does occur, and it occurs with enough frequency, probably in at least a third of cases, that to see it, it's the first thing we always look for. We just look at that differential on any of these mnemonic cases, and if there's peripheral eosinophilia, say 7%, that's you know, again, you're not going to see that with a bacterial process that should really make you think of valley fever. So what are the complications of primary pulmonary coxy? Well, what we get first of all is pulmonary residua. So you get this mnemonic process and then it has to heal. And in healing, one gets a variety of processes. And we're going to talk about those nodules, cavities, and then complications such as pyonumothorax or chronic disease. One of the most common things we see are nodules. Uh, and a nodule is a resolution of the initial pulmonary infiltrate. Um, nodules are almost always benign. They may cavitate and cause a cavity. Uh, but uh, other than that, they will usually resolve. The problem with a nodule is that unless you've actually followed it from the time of the pneumonia, these are very, very difficult by any means to distinguish from a pulmonary malignancy. And what I've learned over the years is I'm an infectious diseases doctor, so I have sort of a different view of malignancies. When I work with my pulmonary colleagues, they are extremely aggressive about excluding a pulmonary malignancy. And that becomes a big problem in Arizona where nodules are frequently due uh, to coccidioidomycosis. And that's where the whole problem resides. Now, here are some examples of nodules. Here's a patient that begins with what looks like a mnemonic process, fairly dense, and then uh, 
even just 10 days later, is already sort of defining itself. And if we look here, by the end of the month, it's already sort of rounded up. So when we have those cases, we're in good shape. Now, what I tell all my patients whenever I see them for primary pulmonary coccidioidomycosis and I see this evolution is you, I educate the patient that they are developing a nodule and they need to do that because let's, and we've had this happen, they go out, they're driving on speedway and they get in a car accident and they go to another hospital and they get an x-ray. And I've actually had this happen and the radiologist will say, uh, can't exclude a pulmonary malignancy. And at least on one episode, the patient came back, was very upset, and we could show the patient all, all his x-rays and show, no, no, your nodule's exactly the same, don't worry. So all patients need to be educated about this evolution because they'll, if they go somewhere else, have a chest radiograph, the default is, is to say this is likely a pulmonary malignancy for the very reasons I told you, people don't want to miss these. I actually have a patient right now in Minneapolis, the same issue going on where we're working with the, the uh, 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 clinicians at the University of Minnesota and, and at the VA to sort of sort out this patient's pulmonary status. Does he, did he have a malignancy with his coxy? And we have to work that out. But in many cases, you can, you can sort it out just by having serial chest x-rays. So always educate your patient about this. So here's a classic solitary nodule right there. So how do you approach these? Well, again, it depends who you are, but I'm an infectious diseases doctor, so I'm not quite as aggressive as my pulmonary colleagues. So if I have a patient who's a non-smoker, a positive serology, and even if I've not, if I've seen that evolution, I'm probably not going to do anything. But let's say I just come up with this nodule, they have a positive serology and they're a non-smoker. I may simply get x-rays over time after discussing that with the patient. Now, clearly, the patient's nervous about that, I might send them on. But if they're okay with that, I might just follow them radiographically because nodules get smaller and malignancies get bigger. Now, PET scans are frequently positive, and this has been a big bugaboo. We're trying to publish these data. PET scans are frequently positive. In our experience, uh, 80 to 100 percent of coccidioidal nodules are going to light up on a PET scan, and they're going to light up in a way that's a malignancy. So you'll often see people going to PET scans. Now, PET scans will pick up they are, they are used to stage malignancies, but it's well known that they're positive in infections. It's just that somehow everyone's forgotten that. I don't understand why, because it's extant in the literature. But so, so pulmonologists in particular, when they see a nodule, will get a PET scan. If you do that in coccidioidomycosis, it's going to light up. And not only will it light up in the nodule, it may light up in the mediastinum. And then the patient will be told, as once happened in a patient at uh, Boston Medical Center I was called about, that they have, disseminate, they have inoperable lung cancer. And I'll show you those in a moment, but please uh, be very wary of ordering PET scans. Our feeling is they give you no additional information to manage the patient with a nodule. Finally, when to do biopsy. Well, if there's ever any concern, certainly if the patient is a smoker, certainly if the lesion is growing, if there's any issue at all, then one should go on and attempt to biopsy that nodule. So here's just an example of a, of a PET scan. So here's, and PET scans are done uh, by combining a, currently, by combining a CT with the uh, positron emission, and then you get this combined uh, film, which you see on the bottom. So here's just a CT scan of this pulmonary nodule uh, that you can see in the uh, left upper lobe. And then you can see the PET lights up, so you end up on the bottom with a positive lesion. So, and this is a case of, of established coccidioidomycosis. So these things do light up. As I say, we had them light up in the vast majority of cases who had coccidioidomycosis. So if you're going to do a biopsy, what might you do? Well, the most common thing is bronchoscopy with transthoracic biopsy um, or, or percutaneous fine needle aspirate. But realize in both these techniques, you may not get to the lesion. So you may come up with a negative test. Now, if you do that, what you're supposed to do is do it again. 
But what frequently happens, particularly with, uh, with either of these methods, is the patient will get a small or sometimes large pneumothorax. So everyone's enthusiasm for doing this again kind of drops dramatically, both the patient and the physicians. But realize you haven't, it's like you didn't do anything. You may have dropped the patient's lung, but you didn't make a diagnosis. So either you pursue that or you're back to doing what I frequently do is following the patient. Now, you can be more invasive and do video-assisted thoracotomy or even open thoracotomy. One of the strange things I've noticed when I interact uh, with, with uh, patients or with the public is the angriest patients I've seen are patients who've been operated on for these nodules and, be, and then been told, oh, this is coccidioidomycosis. And I f still don't quite understand it, but I think it comes from that they've been told that they have a pulmonary malignancy, that they need to undergo these tests or this test. Uh, sometimes they have complications from it, and then they're told, oh, never mind, it was benign. So there is a downside to being very aggressive with these nodules uh, when they turn out to be uh, 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 benign. So let's move on to cavities. So cavities are the result of a previous nodule that has excavated. It's actually uh, gotten into the airway so the material inside the cavity can then uh, be coughed out. Uh, most cavities are completely asymptomatic, but there can be symptoms associated with this, including cough, hemoptysis, which is usually mild, but again is a very disturbing uh, symptom to a patient, pleuritic chest pain, uh, and frequently, the sputum uh, culture is positive. Now, these will close without therapy, but not if they're large. So if they're greater than four centimeters, these are likely to persist and may have uh, 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 caused problems. And one of the problems they cause is they may become secondarily infected. And they get secondary infected with three things. They may actually get secondarily infected with coccidioides itself. So the cocci will actually start growing as a mycelium in the cavity. And that can be irritative and cause coughing. Occasionally, you will see an aspergilloma in those. And probably uh, most frequently is these get secondarily infected with bacteria. So sort of ana uh, antithetically, you would end up treating these cavities with antibiotics because, uh, because you'll see them, they'll actually fill up. There'll be a cavity and suddenly uh, they'll become radio-opaque and the patient's cough will increase and often the answer is to give them an antimicrobial, an antibacterial uh, in addition to an antifungal because they become secondarily infected with a bacterium. So here's a rather large cavity in one of my patients, and, I, uh, and she recently actually underwent an extirbation of this. We finally convinced her. And one of the issues we've seen when we've done surgeries, often cavities return after, after surgery. But this cavity is, is very unlikely and didn't close on its own. It's much too large. Here's a smaller cavity with an air fluid level. And when we did a CT scan, uh, you can see there are actually two cavities, uh, the one anterior with the air fluid level and the other not. And generally, cavities are, are reported as thin-walled, but as you can see, these aren't strikingly thin-walled, and these are due to coccidioides. Now, the one thing I want to really uh, alert you guys to is a rare but known complication, and that's called pyopneumothorax. And this occurs when a cavity that is sitting right underneath the pleura ruptures into the pleural space. So you get a collapse of, of the lung with pleural fluid. And the patient will present, they'll notice sudden dyspnea with or without pleuritic uh, chest pain. And this is what this looks like. So if you can see on uh, your left, there is a nodule in the left lower lobe. Uh, or a cavity, I'm sorry, and then you see afterwards. And this was actually a patient, a diabetic woman, who we had seen and kind of lost a follow-up, and she said in October, well, I, I kind of felt short of breath, and we didn't see her uh, because she, didn't, she came in to her primary care physician, got a routine chest X-ray, which showed the image on the right, and so she was immediately referred to it. So she had actually been walking around with this for months, uh, just feeling a little bit dysmic. So this is a classic presentation on the right, and if you see it, you've got a completely collapsed lung with, a, with, an, with an air fluid level, and again, if you're in Tucson or Phoenix, this is going to be a pyonumothorax due to coxie. 
Uh, this is the most common thing, and, and, the, and the importance is just to recognize this phenomenon. So we can see on the CT scan why this would happen. This is after she's collapsed because we can see there's her cavity with an air fluid level sitting, abutting right against that pleura. Should that mean you should treat if you had someone with a cavity that was against the pleura? Should you be more aggressive? Should you do something about it? No, but it's important to just be aware that these cavities can do it. They don't do it commonly, but when they do, it results in this dramatic event. Now, chronic pulmonary coccidioidomycosis is actually relatively uncommon and uh, was reported years ago by my friend George Sorosi and I think used to be a more common manifestation. Now what we usually see is patients with chronic lung disease who then get coxie and it just goes on and on. So how much is that the coxie and how much is that their underlying lung disease? But it is just a very persistent course. Here's a classic. We see this in histoplasmosis as well, patient with terrible lung disease and just persistent pulmonary coccidioidomycosis. So what about diagnosis specific to this issue? Well, most cases of pulmonary cocci are diagnosed by positive serology. Mike is going to talk about that. It is worth sending the lab a sputum culture. Um, you should alert the lab that you are sending it for cocci because cocci is a major laboratory hazard. Most microbiology laboratories in Arizona are very aware of this. They'll pick it up. We've had our lab pick it up on a routine culture. Coxie can grow. We, our, our record is to see it in two days, uh, but usually it grows in three to seven days, and it'll grow on a blood auger plate. So the labs and all the labs in, 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 in Arizona are good at picking those up and taping the plates, but it's always nice to just let them know you're looking for that. And in fact, then they can do a fungal culture, which might pick up more cases. Obviously, if someone grows coccidioides out of their sputum, they have coccidioidomycosis. So that is a, dog, a good diagnostic test. So what should you do if you see a patient that you suspect having a pul pulmonary coccy? Well, of course, get a chest x-ray. As Rebecca emphasized, get a serology. I think everybody should get a serology for any kind of mnemonic process in Arizona. It's reasonable to try to get a sputum for fungal culture. If you can, do a first morning specimen just like what we would do for tuberculosis. Uh, often it's very scant, and as I mentioned, alert the laboratory. And follow up and repeat testing, as I think Rebecca alluded to and Mike will talk about, that uh, the serology may be negative early and repeated testing may uh, turn up positives that were not initially positive. Now, finally, treatment. Um, most patients with pulmonary disease, as I've already alluded, will not require therapy. And in our guidelines written in 2005, we listed these reasons, symptoms that are ongoing and not improving after eight weeks, intense night sweats, a 10% weight loss, large uh, volume of lung involved, a prominent or persistent adenopathy, a very high serology, inability to work in older age. Those are all criteria that one can use, but I want to emphasize that most patients will not require therapy. And a study we did, which gets a lot of discussion because it was a case control study uh, that Dr. Galgiani and I did in our, uh, in our clinic. And so it wasn't a randomized controlled trial. So of 105 patients with uh, primary pulmonary uh, coccidioidomycosis that had been referred to us, uh, we decided not to treat 51 and we treated 54. Now, we decided to write this up as a study. One of my fellows came to me and was very impressed with why, how well patients had done that we didn't treat. He would see patients in clinic that we had never treated and they had done fine. The other reason we did the study is because we had been noticing clinicians were treating patients and recommending treating patients because it would prevent dissemination. And in fact, we knew that we had patients that we had treated and stopped therapy after a prolonged period for pulmonary disease. It's still disseminated. So we wanted to write that up, and that was the purpose of the study. Now, one of the points of the study is because it wasn't a randomized controlled trial, there were probably differences between the 54 we treated and the 51 we didn't. 
uh, probably the 51 we didn't treat were a little more healthy, not as ill. Uh, but in fact, when one analyzed that, it was hard to see those differences. Well, what did we find? That there were no differences in the rate of improvement be between those we treated and those we didn't. That is, when we used a score of improvement, patients improved just as well <clears throat> without therapy as with therapy. None of the untreated patients had any complications, so that's just like the Valdivia study. We didn't treat them, they all did fine. But two of our prospectively followed patients, when we stopped therapy after prolonged courses, still disseminated. So our conclusions for that, number one, and this is the rule I have in clinic, if I get a patient referred to me and has, with valley fever and it's diagnosed and they're already improving, I do not initiate therapy. I just don't. I follow them. And I have yet to see a patient worsen. Uh, if therapy is indicated, what we have done is continue therapy for six months. There's nothing magic about that number. Uh, and then we follow that patient for at least a year. We have seen relapses. And in fact, the study I mentioned, we saw a lot of pulmonary relapses in people initially treated who were stopped. So you do want to follow your patient after. And you certainly want to follow your patients that you don't treat. And importantly, at least in our study, antifungal therapy did not prevent subsequent dissemination. So the way to monitor for that is to follow the patient. Patients who are going to disseminate will do that. Then you can institute treatment or restart therapy. But don't just treat a patient because you think that will prevent dissemination. It doesn't. Now, what about special hosts? And Rebecca uh, referred to these. First of all, something I'm very interested in is HIV infection. Uh, when I first came to Tucson in 1985, I set up the HIV clinic at the Tucson VA, and we studied this. 41% of our patients got valley fever, and many of them died of it. We redid that study a few years ago in the uh, effective an uh, antiretroviral uh, era, and patients uh, do very, very well. So the rule now is that patients, if they have a CD4 count above 250, uh, I treat them as if they're any other patient. That is, I may not start antifungal therapy uh, if they have primary pulmonary disease. So HIV patients have done much, much better. Now, pregnancy, we just uh, wrote a paper for uh, 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 clinical infectious diseases reviewing pregnancy. And the issues there is second and third trimester, and as Rebecca has emphasized, postpartum, uh, pregnant women who've never been infected, who acquire coccidioidomycosis, get very, very severe disease. Uh, first trimester, much less likely, and women who already have had uh, a valley fever tend to do relatively well. The issue there was about uh, use of azoles. Azoles are teratogenic, and what we tried to point out is that they're teratogenic in the first trimester. But the real important point is you can use azoles later in pregnancy. Um, patients with transplant, I think Janice is going to talk about that, and of course TNF-alpha inhibitors are a problem. That's going to be discussed this afternoon. In most immunosuppressed patients, the default is to treat. Now, Rebecca has alluded to sex, age, and race, that males are more likely to get symptomatic disease than females, that the risk for symptomatic disease clearly increases in those as they age, and that African-American men and probably Filipino men appear to be at a distinct uh, increased risk. Now, the importance there is not that they should all be treated, but you really want to follow your patients with, who are African-American or Filipino men with primary disease much more closely. I will tell you on the other side, when we do skin test studies, uh, we have uh, a host of African-American men who we skin test, and they have a very strong response. So not all African-American men have problems with coxie and do poorly. So it doesn't mean you treat more aggressively, you follow more aggressively. Nodules and cavities, I can't recall ever treating a nodule. I don't treat them. Cavities are treated if they're symptomatic, and they are sort of problematic in how they can do that. And certainly if they're large, I would consider surgical extirpation. Now, which antifungal? 
We almost always use uh, a triazole, oral triazole therapy. It's rare to use amphotericin B, uh, except in the most severe cases. I reserve amphotericin B for those overwhelming pulmonary coccidioidomycosis that occurs in highly immunosuppressed or high inoculum exposures like I showed you. Otherwise, I'm going to begin fluconazole. Fluconazole is well tolerated, well absorbed, has fewer adverse reactions than the other triazoles, itraconazole in particular. The newer azoles, we don't have a lot of data, and we certainly don't have a lot of data in primary pulmonary disease. They are more complex to use, particularly voriconazole, so I would tend to avoid those except in very problematic cases. So if I were going to treat, I would use fluconazole. Let me go back before I end. What is the dose? The dose is actually relatively high. We start with a dose of 400 milligrams. And my new colleague was just asking, uh, because we, we started a patient yesterday, why doesn't fluconazole come in a 400 milligram dose? Because that's an unusually high concentration. So 200 is the standard for other fungal infections. So 400 is our standard dose. <clears throat> 